When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that would like to point out that once again, we skipped leg day. Here is the captain. Been skipping leg day for 40 years. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This week, we are very happy to be featuring Wishing Star Cold IPA in a beautiful purple aqua and several other delightful shades of blue on this can. This is another wonderful and delicious beer from the great folks at Asheville's original craft brewery. You know I'm talking about one of our faves, Highland Brewing Company, brewing great beer since 1994. This one, Wishing Star, is 6.8% ABV and garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And who helped us fill up the fridge for today's show? Let's give some shout outs. Who do we have up first, Captain? We have a big we like to jib to Kristen Enfinger from Thomasville, Georgia. And a cheers and a tip of the cap to Savannah Marchioni from Summersville, South Carolina. Everyone we just mentioned went to truecrimegarage.com and clicked on the pint glass. And for that, we thank you. Yeah, B W E W R U N beer run. You get a beer, you get a beer, and you, sir, get a beer. For everything true crime, go to truecrimegarage.com and sign up on the mailing list. And if you're not following us on YouTube, check us out on YouTube. A lot of videos we're posting. Almost, we're almost up to a thousand videos. So follow us on YouTube. And Colonel, that's enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Parts of the following are from the Gazette out of Cedar Rapids, an article by Val Swinton. Calling her murder a crazy act of wickedness, the Reverend Bernard Obser sought to comfort friends and relatives of Rhonda Knudsen with the reminder she is in a heavenly mansion with Jesus Christ. An overflow crowd of more than 500 mourners packed the Trinity Lutheran Church for Knudsen's funeral. Her body was found in the back of the Williamstown store. No motive had been established, and no arrests have been made. Things go haywire in this world, occasionally, Obser said. As in Rhonda's death, someone allowed the power of evil to take over his life and snuff out Rhonda's. 
and Rhonda's case, we can say, what does it mean? There's got to be more than just the piece of iron wielded by a crazy person in the middle of the night. Youth is more than just preparation for life, he said. It is life itself. You cannot use today to set the stage for tomorrow. There may be no tomorrow. This is True Crime Garage. This week we go to a great place with a great name, Chickasaw County in the Hawkeye State, Iowa. Chickasaw County is in the almost very northeastern part of the great state of Iowa. About 12,000 people living in the county, so I'm picturing some wide open spaces here. The county is named after the Chickasaw tribe, and the county seat is New Hampton. Back in 1992, one person living in the county was 22-year-old Rhonda Knutson. Rhonda was known to be a hard worker. She was a creative person and an artist. She came from a very big family. Rhonda was one of seven kids to parents Mary and Nels Knutson. That's six too many. And we will see this was a very big family even beyond Rhonda's immediate family of nine people. All of the seven kids have first names that start with the letter R. So today we are talking about Rhonda and her brothers are Robert, Roger, Richard, and Rodney. And her sisters are Renee and Rochelle. Rhonda graduated from New Hampton High School in 1988. Where we pick up Rhonda's story, she is 22 years old. She's in a long-term relationship with her boyfriend, Al. It looks like they've been together for about three years by this time and been living together for about two years. And just to get this out of the way, you say Chickasaw. I say Chickasaw hee haw. <laughs> Rhonda worked at the Phillips 66 store. This is an open all day and all night, 24 hour convenience store. I'm guessing it would get a lot of traffic just given its location. It's just six miles south of New Hampton. Again, that's the county seat. Everyone knows a key ingredient to a successful business is the actual location and the potential traffic, right? Right. Well, this store is on U.S. Highway 63 and just a quarter of a mile from the junction of Highway 63, 18, and 346. So we're going to see a ton of highway traffic, people traveling across or through the state, and especially semi-trucks. Rhonda works the overnight shift at the Phillips 66 station. I was an overnight worker for a couple of years, Captain. Many call it third shift. We called it third trick because oftentimes these types of stores have close proximity to a highway or in this case, three highways. That certainly increases the risk of a potential robbery or a holdup at this location. Now, the overnight shift when there are less employees and less customers coming in and out of the store, this increases the possibility of the store being targeted for such crimes as well. More than one person in Rhonda's life encouraged her to switch to either a different shift or to change jobs. But Rhonda told everyone that she really liked working the overnight shift and had done so for a period of time. Well, and anybody that has worked at a convenience store, you you get regulars. And I will say from my experience working third shift, it certainly has its pros and cons. I guess one check mark in the pro column for Rhonda would be that that is actually how she met her boyfriend. She was working at the Phillips 66, and at the time, he was driving a truck for a creamery company, and so the two met there. So this point in the story takes us to the late summer of 1992. This is Labor Day, and I don't know if this has any bearing on our case, but Captain, you know I'm always interested when a holiday is involved. Portions of the population operate on different schedules on holidays, and when we are talking a murder case, as we often do here in the garage, we are most certainly going to discuss motive, means, and opportunity. Who has it and who doesn't is key. 
So while it may mean nothing, it also could mean everything. So on this date, Monday, September 7, 1992, Rhonda's overnight shift is the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. time slot. Rhonda's boss typically is the one to relieve her at the end of her shift. When he arrives, he finds Rhonda dead in what is described as a back room. Her boss then sends in a call to emergency services at 4.45 a.m. The general statements about this case are these. In the early morning hours of Monday, September 7, 1992, Rhonda Annette Knudsen was murdered while working the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift at the Phillips 66 convenience store in Chickasaw County. The store was located six miles south of New Hampton on U.S. Highway 63 and one quarter mile north of the junction of the three highways. The store was open 24 hours a day, but currently no longer exists. So today, due to road construction, they have expanded the lanes and the roads and the highways. So where the gas station slash store once stood, now is a road in place of that, my friend. So it's determined right away that the probable cause of death was severe traumatic head injuries. Yeah, this would have been severe traumatic head injuries from a beating with a blunt object. Now, we talked about motive, means, and opportunity already, but we're going to try to sort through those things as we sift through the information that we have in this case. Right. This case remains unsolved to this day. We're talking over 30 years later, and the family and law enforcement and really the county, it's a close-knit county in town of New Hampton and Williamstown, they're still looking for justice here in this case. A lot of people have not forgotten about this case 31 years later. Yeah, it's interesting because this is a pretty popular case if you talk to people in the area, mm -hmm. but just hasn't got the coverage nationwide. Law enforcement, and there have been several different agencies working this case over the years. In fact, the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigations got involved very early in the investigation. I believe the Chickasaw County Sheriff's Department requested the assistance of the FBI as well for them to get involved. But I don't believe that they ever, that the FBI ever did any work on the case, but regardless good by those at the sheriff's department to get, or at least request other agencies to get involved because this is a case that if you close your eyes, you can picture it, right? It's a case that takes place in the dark of night. So I think about this case as this brief, quick, isolated, violent incident going down in a matter of minutes. Well, they always say that the 3 a.m. time slot is the witching hour. How long was the killer or killers in the store? We are going to try to sort through that, but it may have been only a short period of time. But you have this murder taking place in this stretch of land, not a huge population, this should have just been another laid back night at the gas station. But because of the highways, we could be talking about a killer or killers that came from another town, a city down the road on one of the highways or another state. And then the same is true for the post defense movements of the perpetrator or perpetrators. Relatively quickly, this killer could be in another town, in a city, in another portion of Iowa, or even in another state. Right. So good by the men and women over at the Chickasaw Sheriff's Department to request the assistance of DCI and FBI, who we have DCI who can cover you for manpower, expertise, and resources throughout the state of Iowa. Well, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. You don't have to be the smartest guy in the room. You just have to be the one that invited the smartest guy there. You just have to be one of the guys in the room that helped get this thing done at the end of the day. I would wager Franklin that someone at the FBI would later regret not getting involved, especially with something that we covered last year. Remember, we have the FBI's Highway Serial Killings Initiative, and we're going to see a couple of different things in this case. Potential serial killer being involved or identified or unknown. Also, potential trucker being responsible for this death. Now, why would that be something that the FBI would be interested in? 
We just checked both of those boxes for you. But again, you can imagine with a small town murder case like this, early rumors were that either a trucker was involved, a serial killer was involved. And I guess we should say serial killer that may have been a trucker involved. The other weird rumor that was circulating in town was that potentially a sheriff's deputy may be responsible. Now, what is difficult about this rumor, Captain, is as far as I could find searching high and low, no single sheriff's deputy was named in particular. That was more of a blanket theory in the case. And we will see why, given the location and some more information about our victim. Now, before we get too far into the weeds here, we need to talk about a website that I know we have discussed before here in the garage, but that's because they do such gangbusters work. Everyone should go read this website. It's iowacoldcases.org. They are the primary source for us today. They cover a lot of Iowa cases that you have heard of, maybe even heard them here in the garage. We have Jody Husentrout, Johnny Gosh, Tammy Joe Zawicki, just to name a few. So if you want to do a deep dive on some fascinating unsolved cases, I tell you many a night I have lost myself on that website spelunking the rabbit holes of Iowa cold case. Let's get into more information about the crime scene and the injuries to the victim. Yeah. The crime scene information and the autopsy information is something that's going to help us sort out some of the issues that this case itself presents. The store information, just general information about the store is very confusing. I think a little confusing anyway to outsiders, but what we can tell you is we have been saying Phillips 66, and that is absolutely true. This store was both a convenience store and, as the old timers say, a filling station. They sold gas as well. I think the gas station portion is key to this case and potentially key to our perpetrator or perpetrators who are responsible. Sometimes, especially back in the day and in these more out in the country type areas, you will see a gas station with a well-known commercial brand of gas being sold. You'll see the sign, right? This says Phillips 66 gas unleaded being sold for back then in 1992. I was, we were both too young to be driving back then, but I would guess unleaded may have gone for what captain 75, 80 cents a gallon back then. Yeah, I might have been too young to drive, but I was driving. I was, was jacking cars. Back then, you have yeah. the convenience store that is attached. So here, they don't share the same name. You see the sign that's Phillips 66 Gas. Here, the store itself was called the Williamstown Store. The locals called it Billstown. The Billstown Store, or for short, Billstown. It's a small building. This is not one of those large pilot or flying J gas stations and stores. Right. This is a small building. Judging by the pictures, if they have a restroom at all or restrooms at all, it's probably one of those situations where you're going inside asking for the key and then you have to go back outside to a door on the outside of the store. The question on everybody's mind, are you man enough to eat a hot dog from one of these stores? Roller food, as they call it. I yeah. used to be a big roller food guy when I was like 18, 19 <laughs> years old, but that's also the only thing I could afford. So your, your intestines are probably glad you're past those. So days. I can say in this situation for this question, back when I was a boy, I was much more of a man than I am today. The store sold, I don't know about roller food here, captain, but the store sold coffee snacks and I would guess cigarettes and newspapers as well. This is a small right. store, but people would go in and frequent the store. It appears that they had three gas pumps out front. Now, most of the reports, we do not get a time of death. And yet, very quickly in this investigation, law enforcement is going to be asking the public for their help. The, the simple information that we get is just that she was working the 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift and then found dead in the morning. The person that found her was the store's owner. So he's a longtime owner, 
slash operator of the store. His name is Ray Robrock. He said that he arrived at 4.45 a.m. that Monday morning and found Rhonda lying fully clothed in a back room. It sounds like there may have only been one back room to this small store. So Ray is going to find Rhonda, but unfortunately she is already dead. She's been attacked. She's dead upon his arrival. Of course, he phones it in immediately. The county seat is nearby, so the sheriff's department will arrive rather quickly. And to top that off, not just proximity, the deputies know the store. They know the gas station very well. And they probably know Rhonda. Exactly. They did know Rhonda. And in one of one of several statements, they say this case is extra difficult because we know the victim. We personally knew the victim because many of them would stop in for snacks or even to get gas while on shift, while they're working their shifts fairly often. And a lot of these convenience stores they give free coffee to law enforcement. The good ones do. And everybody should continue to do that because you know what? It's does not hurt your business. If cops are in there, it it prevents crimes. It prevents theft and things like that. If they, if the cops feel good about coming in and know that they're going to be greeted with a smile, a friendly welcome and a hot cup of coffee. And that's what they got at Rhonda's store when they would visit her. In fact, more than one deputy said that we would go in there to get gas or get a snack. And maybe we felt in some way that we were checking on her, making sure she was safe and the store was safe. But there were other times that we would be driving by and slow down, honk the horn, and she would pop up in the window or, or step into the doorway and just wave. You know, this right. is the middle of the night. You need to pass the time for both the sheriff's deputies and the person working at this Billstown store. Can we dive into more of the information of where she's found in the store? Yeah, that I think that's very interesting, Captain. I'm glad that you brought that up. The back room where Rhonda was found, it does not have a safe in it. Right. So for whatever the back room may play in this investigation, it's not for the purpose of emptying out a safe. Yeah, it makes you wonder if she was attacked in the store and then dragged into the back room so maybe delaying somebody finding her or was she attacked in the back room because as you know sometimes they have stock back there and so when it gets a little slow part of your job is to restock some of the shelves and maybe responsibly so but i believe there could be a whole bunch of hold back information in this case at times i find that i I agree with it, and other times I don't agree with it. And I think you take each piece of information on a case-by-case basis. But if you're holding back a whole bunch of information about the crime scene and the way that the victim's found, keep in mind, this is a small town, right? 12,000 people for the entire county. We have the owner who found her. I'm sure he shared with people what his experience was and and, and what he saw. We have and possibly law enforcement as well. Correct. We have deputies there who would have seen things. And so what I wonder about this case is when I'm trying to picture and work through how the crime may have went down, how the murder may have went down, you're trying to figure out what you just said, right? Was she attacked in the front room and then dragged back there for some other purpose? One one simple purpose could have been either there would have been an attempted sexual assault after the attack and maybe the attacker heard somebody come into the store and decided to take off. Right. Or got spooked somehow. Got spooked. Right. Where did the attack take place? Unfortunately, given the, the injuries, we know that there's going to be a considerable amount of blood. Did they find that blood in the front portion of the store or only in the back room of that store? As you say, captain, was she dragged back there or If she's attacked back there, it makes you wonder a couple of other things. If there's no safe, what, why was she and the killer in that back room at the same time? Right. Was it for the purpose of the killer to do something else to the victim or to conceal the body? Or is it just simply that? Yes. To conceal the body that the killer dragged the body into this back room to buy some time and conceal the body or 
did the attack go down in that back room? Because this was somebody that she was comfortable enough with that they happened to be in the back room together talking about something, you know, that on this third shift, you have people that would come in and talk with her and talk with the other employees. Is this somebody that was kind of just following her around the store as she's carrying out her duties throughout the night? And she felt comfortable with this person following her around. And for whatever reason, the attack happen to occur in this back room. I think that you could put different potential suspects or possibly who did this into different categories by knowing something simple as as simple as that about the crime scene itself. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. All right, we are back, you filthy animals. Cheers to you, Colonel. Cheers to everybody in the back. Hey, most importantly, cheers to you, Captain. It is, it's the Captain's birthday mm-hmm. week, all week here in the garage, and we cannot wait until we can celebrate with all of you this Saturday at BrewDog with beers in hand. Yeah, and I, I'm just going to give you a warning. I might get a little tipsy. Well, if you don't, I'm leaving. Here's the thing, Captain, when we're looking at this case right now, we have to wonder, oftentimes the killer is local, oftentimes the killer knows the victim. So now if this case in Rhonda Knudsen's case, I think it'd be different if it was at a house or apartment or something, but this is at a fill-up station, basically, in a heavy traffic area where a lot of people are going to be either traveling these roads, especially like you said, Labor Day, or it's going to be a, possibly a trucker. Right. And given the holiday, that's why I wonder things about people's routines when you have something like a holiday. Labor Day, traditionally, a lot of jobs and occupations, people don't go to their jobs on Labor Day. So could you, you while you could be seeing an increase in traffic, as far as people traveling great distances because of the holiday, you likely would see the reverse on the local level, Mm -hmm. less traffic from the local. So I wanted to kind of sort through this part of it because you're spot on my friend about wondering if this could be somebody from far away. If this killer were local or someone that knew Rhonda, what would they likely know about the situation? This goes to our means and opportunity portions of the investigation. Right. So we know the store is open 24 hours a day. Locals will know this. We have a store owner, Ray. He's the owner slash operator. The store has the owner who works there and four employees. 
the shifts are covered by one single attendant at all times. So other than that 15 minute window, when a person is ending their shift and a new worker comes in to start their shift, as far as employees go, there's only one in the store at a time. And so locals and people that knew Rhonda would know that. Yeah, locals would know that. And they'd also know she's a young, attractive female and she's working alone. And then on the flip side of things, if it's a traveler, then they're coming into an opportunity. A young, attractive female working by herself. Right. And if this were a robbery that went bad and for whatever reason ends up not appearing to be as such... You also know that you have employees working at the store where there's 1992, there's cash money in those registers. Yep. And there's one person in the store working at a time. So, and then to take that a step further, a lot of criminals are cowards and a lot of them will choose to attack or rob a female or an elderly person because it appears to be an easier target, a less threatening target to the criminal. Well, here's a question that I have for you that I can't find the answer to. I understand that there's no safe in this back room, but that doesn't mean that the protocol wasn't, Hey, once your drawer gets filled up with a certain amount of cash, you bundle that cash and place it somewhere in the back room. That's interesting. And if that's the case, it's not mentioned in any of the the stories, but that could be something that would be hold back information as far as law enforcement's concerned. Now, but it also can be confusing information because if that store owner didn't keep a very tight inventory, there might not be any way of knowing whether there was money that was taken from the crime scene or not. Well, and talking about a potential easy target, Again, going back to the idea that a criminal, for whatever reason, whatever crime that they are intending to commit, may want to target a location or person that presents less of a threat or a perceived less of a threat. We said we have the owner and we have four employees. Of those four employees working by themselves, three of them are female. Right. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Five people that work there, two of them are male, and three of them are female. But anytime that we have a victim, we have to look at the inner circle and the immediate outer circle. And so you have current employees of the station. You have boyfriends of the current employees of the station. You have friends. Is there somebody that knew this? And would that make sense of why the victim was found in the back room? Right. And with this case, when we talk about truckers or potentially a traveling serial killer, we also need to look at, well, what would the locals know? What would the people that knew Rhonda know? Even, you know, the locals that knew her didn't know her. What would they know about the situation? And the situation would be this. They know that a single person is working there. There's cash in the register. There's. Rhonda, who worked the overnight shift for a long time. So many of the locals would likely know that she would be expected. She works five days a week, the overnight shift. Yes, yeah, there a certain reason why you keep saying the situation. Now, one key element to the case, though, is this. It sounds to me that the store had a good deal of regulars and people that would drop in and not just buy something or fill up the old gas tank but they would stick around for a bit, talk, shoot the breeze. In fact, there were early morning farmers that made regular trips to the station routinely to start out their day. I used to be one of the regulars third shift when our buddy JJ worked at, I believe it was a speedway. And I would regularly just stop in, grab a coffee, grab some smokes, sit around and chat for a little bit and just kind of shoot the shit and kind of be a compadre and wasting a little time with our buddy JJ. He had, I know he had several regulars that would drop in and hang out for 15 minutes or 20 minutes. And these were people that he only knew from the gas station. Right. 
And then in this case, there were persons that would drop in and visit and even bring things to Rhonda or even give things to whoever was working. I'm sure they all had their favorite employee or or their person that they would see during their routine. So it's been noted that people would bring in things like crops, like corn, peppers, things from their farms or their gardens and give to the person working. Yeah, wasn't there a bag of peppers found in the store? I know that on at least one occasion, someone came in and gave peppers, a bag of peppers to Rhonda. I don't know if it was on the same night that she was attacked. Right. So the store, even the overnight shift, it does not appear like you're sitting there every night for very long periods of time with no one coming in. Now, having said that, we review these cases. Many of them are unsolved murders. Many of them are from the 90s. And I am always aggravated and frankly appalled at the extreme lack of security. Yeah, it's monkey shit. Yeah, it's very upsetting to hear that you have a young woman who is brutally attacked in a store where she's working alone and there's no security camera. There's no alarm system. And as the employee stated with this case, no weapon behind the counter to defend yourself with. Yeah, even if they're fake cameras, they're at least a deterrent. Yeah, smile, you're on camera. We've all seen that that poster or that sign posted going into a gas station or once you're inside. And I don't get it. Here's the thing. You have to wonder how many beautiful lives would have been saved across this great land over the years by simply having a camera system in a place of business. Well, that's one of the things that we know about a lot of serial killers. They're travelers because they don't have a, a close group of friends for the most part, especially like on a long weekend. These guys would plan sometimes to travel and to, hey, let me get a couple hundred miles from home and start looking for an opportunity. And if you're a trucker, you're going to be several hundred miles from home potentially anyway. And right. we talked about motive, means, and opportunity. Opportunity doesn't just always mean the opportunity to commit the murder, but also the opportunity to get away with it. So if this were, in fact, a crime of opportunity, well, then you have to wonder, would that opportunity go away? for the perpetrator if there were a camera, if, if he were to see a camera or read a sign that says, smile, you're on camera. And again, you have to wonder how many lives would be saved by that. And you, I would bet that it would be a lot of lives, but of course there is no way of ever knowing. Now, in the defense of Ray Rebrock, who and any small business owner in this particular area of Iowa, and in fact, the entire county murder is not something that happens there with any regularity at all. So that was something that I was immediately interested in knowing when reviewing this case, what is the murder status in this area, especially in the late eighties and the early nineties? Well, cause like you said, it's a very small population. What under 12,000 under 12,000 today. Or right around wow. 12,000 or so today. So, so less than, yeah. And does the investigating agency, which the primary here would be the Chickasaw Sheriff's Department, does that agency have a cold case division? So I jumped on their website. It's chickasawcounty.iowa.gov. You click on departments then click on sheriff and beautiful. They have a tab, not for cold cases, but for unsolved crimes. Right. So the sheriff's department gets high praise from the garage, from the extra crispy colonel here for reminding the public about the unsolved crimes. Mm -hmm. And this case is actually meant to basically mean cold cases. So you click on that, right? Unsolved crimes meant to mean cold cases. And guess what? You get. Send you to don donkey porn. You get homicide 1992. One right. case. This case. Rhonda's case. You get one case. So for the entire county, as far as murders go, the last murder before Rhonda was killed was 12 years prior in 1975. And that, in fact, was a manslaughter charge when a man was run over by a truck. But good for them because some of these small departments would not 
promote that on their website. They'd go, this is a, a black eye on our department that we haven't been able to solve this case in so many years. We're just not going to promote that we haven't solved this one. But good for them to say, hey, this case, we are going to see this to the end. And and that's what I'm saying. I think in the year 2023, when this technology, when computers and websites are are even old news and everybody's on social media, I I do not understand why when you have law enforcement agencies that do not have those unsolved cases listed, especially cold cases when it comes to homicide listed on their website or somewhere for the public yeah, to have an awareness of something. And back to the back to the murder rate here in this county. The last murder before Rhonda was killed, 1975. Then before that, it was eight years earlier in 1967 when a woman was shot by her husband. So while we get angry that there's no security set up here at the store, murder just wasn't a thing that happened here. Yeah, but maybe that's okay at your residency. But if you have if you have workers working by themselves, and I understand it's if you don't have a slew of customers every five seconds, you can't afford to pay to have two employees. But if you're going to have one employee working by themselves, get the surveillance. Because if something does happen, at least you can help in assisting that victim getting justice. One employee captain said that the store was really laid back. The people that came in were really nice. There was never anything that you were ever worried about. And they said, even if the workers were nervous about a suspicious customer, the company policy was pick up the phone. The shirt, the sheriff's off. The sheriff's department was only six miles away. And the boss who you could call at any hour lived just a quarter of a mile away. Right. And then again, as far as robbery at first, that was the speculation, especially because the victim was found fully clothed. It only took a day, maybe two before they ruled out robbery as a motive. They wouldn't elaborate on the cause of death immediately or the weapon used until the autopsy was conducted. However, law enforcement was actively and openly searching the store, the property, and surrounding area for the murder weapon. They brought in the help of 50 rescue workers. This included firefighters and searched along the three highways nearby, searching for possible evidence and the murder weapon. They covered a two-mile radius and were told to look for, quote, a piece of iron but nothing turned up makes you wonder if they brought in scent dogs as well on september 10th we would get some more information the autopsy had been conducted and the public was informed that the autopsy concluded Rhonda died as the result of head injuries after being beaten possibly with a heavy object also law enforcement states to the public a motive for murder has not been determined the no arrests have been made and we are look hmm. no arrests have been made and we are working on a sketch composite drawing of a truck driver that is not a suspect but someone that the sheriff's department would like to talk to hmm. sounds like a suspect they go on to say yeah and rightfully so captain this they go on to say this person is quote believed to be one of the last persons to see Rhonda alive and on September 10th, while the sketch, the composite sketch of the person they wanted to talk to was not available yet at that time, law enforcement did offer up a brief description stating that the person that they are working up a sketch for is a truck driver or believed to be a truck driver described as 35 to 45 years old, heavy set with dark hair and a dark beard. The vehicle that law enforcement believe that this individual is connected to, they described as a semi tractor pulling a silver or white trailer. 
Now, we said earlier that gasoline and the sale of gasoline may be one of the key ingredients in this murder mystery. I say that because it sounds like it was well known probably in this local trucking community or even the extended trucking community. You can take that beyond the state even for that matter. People that travel this stretch of land, she's working the overnight shift. And this is the only stop, the only overnight stop along Highway 63 where truck drivers could buy diesel gasoline between Waterloo, Iowa, and Chester, Minnesota. That's a 114-mile stretch of land. Well, then it makes me question also a motive could be gas because like you said, it's probably 75 cents, but if it's a semi, some of those have, and and I'm kind of speaking out of my ass here, which I, I guess clean your microphone anyways, (laughs) but they normally have two tanks, you know, and the tank can hold up to 150 gallons. And if you have two tanks, that's 300 gallons. So that's possibly 300 and some dollars, not to mention if you have these other vehicles, maybe you're filling up the vehicles that are on this tractor trailer. So would that be enough of a motive to go, well, I'm going to fill up this gas. And as I'm filling up, I'm watching the store. I realize that there's only one person in the store. And that's why the person attacked Rhonda. Well, and in all fairness to you, and really in all fairness to anybody out there listening that have are trying to come up with their own motive, we have this case here where we're being told we don't know what the motive is by law enforcement, by people that were investigating this case and have done so for decades. And like we talked about in our Little Rock Slasher case, where law enforcement are saying the same thing, we don't know what the motive is is here. It's not easily identifiable to us, even in law enforcement, but what we do know, what, what the science and psychology tells us about criminals. And again, I will, I'll quote what we quoted in the little rock slasher case in the decades since that time, psychiatric professionals, law enforcement officials, and those working in behavioral science fields have learned that there is always an understandable motive for murder. Cops and shrinks may disagree on what that motive is and why it evolves, but there is always a motive. Always. I want to thank you all for joining us here in the garage. Join us back tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. Where we hope to have a big show announcement on tomorrow's episode so make sure you join us back here in the garage and until then be good be kind and don't litter Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. With the Internet's best converting checkout, 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms, Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. In fact, Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash podcast free. All lowercase, shopify.com slash podcast free, shopify.com slash podcast free. (laughs) 